I thought maybe someone else was coming out and you were getting excited. Well, good morning. Welcome. My name is Ryan Ashley. I'm one of the new elders here at, at Real Life Church. And I just want to welcome everyone here today. I'm so glad that we can meet in the building again. And I'd like to say a special welcome to everyone that's, that's watching online. Thank you for joining us and we want you to know that you are definitely welcome here. Uh, before we get going, I, some of you may not know me, and so I was going to introduce my family. Aha! So there is a picture of my beautiful family. So that's my beautiful, lovely wife on the left, Amanda, our awesome daughter, Carissa, in the middle. All right? So at least two out of three there are, are beautiful, so that's not too bad. Um, so Amanda and I are both uh, scientists and professors at New Mexico State University. Um, and so she's in the chemistry and biochemistry department. I'm in the animal and range sciences department. Our daughter is 10 years old, and she's a fifth grader at a Mesilla Valley Christian School. Um, and so we, we love, love it here at Real Life Church, and we're so thankful that you're here. And I just want to thank you personally for allowing me to serve as one of your elders. I truly view this as a privilege and a responsibility, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what God can do uh, in and, and through me. All right. So I want to start out with a question. How many of you remember the first time that you ever drove a car all by yourself, solo, no parents, all by yourself, okay? How old were you? Lee, how old, you want to, this is, this is a teacher coming out of me, like, if I know people's names, I'm going to call on them, sorry, Lee. How old were you, Lee? 15, 15 all right, that's pretty young, right? Right, and so also the professor and me, I hope you're in store for another 50-minute lecture, because I, I'm not, I don't know if I can stop before 50 minutes, but I'll try to stop before then. That, that was a joke, is, is this thing on? <laughs> all right, so Lee was 15, Will you believe that I was actually two? I was two years old the first time I ever drove a car without my parents, <laughs> all right? You can probably imagine this was not on purpose, all right? Well, let me, let me paint the scenario and how this happened, okay? So this all started right after my brother was born. Not that necessarily it was his fault, but I mean, it was, this is the timing, okay? So my brother was born, I was two years old, and so kind of a unique thing with my brother and I, we actually have the same birthday, all right? We were both born on January 14th, two years apart. So when I was two years old, I got a brand new baby brother for a birthday present, okay? And so this was probably like a week after that or something like that. And my mom has a checkup, right? So she needs to go back to the, to the doctor, check up for my baby brother, Justin, and she has a checkup, okay? So mind you, where we live at this time, we are in the middle of nowhere. We're living in eastern New Mexico out on a farm, okay? So it's 35 miles for us to get to the hospital, all right? And so this cold January morning, my mom goes to start the vehicle, and at this time we have um, a Jimmy, and I, I don't know if it's a Chevy Jimmy or a GMC. Where's Derek? He would know what this is. GMC, okay. So we used to have a Jimmy back in the day, all right? And so my mom cranked this bad boy up to get it started to start warming up, right? And she leaves me in the Jimmy, goes back inside to get my brother, who's newborn, right? A few days old in a car seat. So she goes in to get my brother. She comes back outside to put him in the Jimmy, and <gasps> the Jimmy is not there. That's right, man. So when she had started that vehicle, you got to think back. I'm not going to say the date because this will date me. But back in this time, we didn't have safety mechanisms, right? You didn't have to, like, push the brake to put it in gear. All you had to do was knock that thing into gear, and here we go. Somehow, I had hit that thing into drive, and it's at this high idle trying to warm up, and poof, we just take off across the road, and we're going. Across. Again, mind you, I'm in the middle of eastern New Mexico. We don't have, like, neighbors, right? There's no one next door. So this vehicle just headed off into a field. It's going off in the distance. My mom comes out carrying my baby brother just like, ah! right? And so then she runs back inside, puts Justin inside the house, and is running back out trying to catch me, okay? So she's trying to catch this Jimmy, which is headed across this field. Now, mind you, my mom had just given birth like a week before, okay? This poor lady, she's like one week postpartum. But, sorry, that's my reproductive talk coming out. She, so she had just given birth, right? So how many moms do we have in the audience? How many of you felt like running after a vehicle after you had just given birth? I'm guessing not too many of you, right? But needless to say, I mean, there's that, that mom instinct, right? That mama bear, she was not going to let her cub get away. And so she's taking off running after trying to catch this Jimmy, you know, which I'm just cruising along, I guess. I don't know. But she soon realizes that she can't catch up with it, right? That, that she's not going to be able to catch up with it on foot. And so she needs some help. Now, at this time, my dad's already gone. He's working somewhere. My mom's all by herself. We don't have another vehicle there. Again, we're on a farm. We don't have neighbors. But we did live close to a highway that had a lot of traffic. So my mom's running back to the highway, and she's just hoping that a car is going to show up. 
right? And sure enough, soon enough, here comes a car. And she starts waving it down, and here comes this little bitty truck, and, she, and, she, and, the, and it stops. And behind the wheel is this very, very elderly man. And so she tries to explain to this man, she's like, okay, we've got to catch that Jimmy that's over there. My son is in it. It's on the loop. We've got to go catch him. Well, he didn't really seem to, to understand because he goes, well, doesn't he have his driver's license? But you know, isn't he, he's okay, right? She's like, no, he's too. It's like, oh, okay, okay. So now they're in this vehicle trying to catch up with me, right? Well, he's still just kind of puttering along, and my mom's trying to be patient, but she's like, Sir, we're going to have to go a lot faster. You're going to have to, like, catch up with that Jimmy so I can jump out and grab it and unlock the door and get in and stop it, okay? And so he finally realizes this and starts taking off and trying to catch up with, with the Jimmy, okay? By this point in time, you know, the Jimmy has this big black, or not black, uh, uh, glass window in the back, right? So I'm plastered against the back, just screaming and crying my eyes out, like, stop this car, right? And so my mom's cruising up, and finally they get close enough. She's able to jump out of the vehicle and get in and, and open the jimmy and get it to stop, all right? Whew, that was quite a day for my mom. I can only imagine, especially now being a parent, I can't even imagine what she was going through. Um, but, you know, looking back on that, um, well, I guess one interesting thing is, you know, for years I've had several dreams where I'll wake up uh, where I've been like, I'll be in a dream, I'm in some car that no one's driving, right? And there's no one behind the wheel. And I kind of wonder where that comes from. Um, I think I know. But, you know, looking back, when my mom used to always tell this story, it was always striking to me what she would always emphasize and focus on was the hope that she had. Like, the main hope was that the whole time of getting up to where I was at in this Jimmy, she was just hoping and hoping that I had not locked the doors, right? Because we had electric cars, you know, electric doors. And if I had hit that electric lock and locked the doors, all hope would have been lost, right? She would have been like... How do I get in this vehicle now, right? Hopefully it hits a tree and it stops or something, right? But luckily I hadn't locked the doors and she's able to get in and stop it, okay? Now, many of you may not be able to relate directly to this story. And in fact, I hope you don't. Um, but I do think probably all of us, right, have, have been through times, you've been through situations where you just felt like there was no hope, right? You just felt hopeless and you wasn't sure what to do. I mean, look at 2020. My gosh, what a crazy year, right? I mean, 2020 alone, when it started last January, it was already a complicated year. We throw in a global pandemic. We have social and racial unrest, right? We've got this contentious election, all right? We have people now that are so divided. They're overwhelmed. They're stressed. People are freaking out, right? Where do we put our hope? People are losing hope, right? You know, if we just look at the effects of the pandemic itself and how we've had to adjust to that, I mean, we've got students from all levels, all the way from kindergarten up to graduate students at the university level that are all having to adjust to online learning, right? And that means that teachers are having to adjust. That means students. That means parents. That means grandparents, right? At all levels are having to adjust to this. And I can tell you as an instructor of college classes and having to deal with this, it was not fun, right? It's, it was difficult. But that pales in comparison to those who've, who've lost loved ones, Right? People have lost loved ones due to COVID. People have lost their livelihoods. They've lost their jobs. People don't know how they're going to pay rent. They don't know how they're going to get food for the next day. How are they going to get another job? Those are some severe issues, right? Things like this, these, these overwhelming problems can just, just cause us to lose hope. Even the pandemic aside, there's many out here, right, that the pandemic is maybe not the big problem for you. Maybe you're suffering from physical abuse, verbal abuse, right? Devastating disease is cancer. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen. It, it, there's no way around that. You know, with, with, with all these hardships and difficulties, it's, it brings lots of emotions, like this whole wave of emotions. We can, feel, we can feel torn. We feel crushed, overwhelmed, lost, devastated, right? And it's no wonder that people can start to lose hope. You know, with all this relentless chaos and conflict in the world, it's where do you find hope, right? Where are you placing your hope, right? How can we have hope in 2021? Well, first, what is hope? Well, hope's kind of somewhat hard to define. Um, there's really two types of hope. If one is a breakable type of hope, okay? And the other is not breakable. So the first one, this breakable kind of hope, this is more like a superficial type of hope. Uh, this is a hope that's more like wishful thinking, you know. Uh, you, you have no particular reason for expecting anything to happen. 
For example, uh, I hope the Broncos win, or I hope I get a bonus this year. I hope I pass this class. I hope we have face-to-face -face classes next semester. Please, God, please. <laughs> right? Now, this hope, this type of hope, lacks a confident certainty, does it not? Especially if you're a Cowboys fan, right? I mean, are you really having confidence you're going to win? I'm sorry, I offended a lot of Cowboys. Sorry, Sam, are you here? Sorry, Cowboys fans. But right, I mean, this type of hope lacks reliability, okay? This type of hope is more like wishful thinking. There's no certainty to it. I don't know about you, but this type of hope doesn't really give me much confidence, does it? Now, what if I told you about another type of hope? Ooh, an unbreakable type of hope. A hope that is divinely guaranteed, a living hope that's talked about in the Bible. Huh? A hope that's a confident assurance, something that's solid, secure, an absolute expectation. Huh? What about something that, that we have no doubt whatsoever that it's going to happen? Wow, that is a cool hope. That's the kind of hope that's talked about in the Bible, right? This type of hope does not disappoint us because it doesn't depend on people. This hope stands in sharp contrast to wishful thinking. This unbreakable hope helped me get through many tough times. It helped me get through 2020, and I know it's going to help me get through 2021, and I hope the same for you. So if we, come, if we look at the Indo-European root word for where we get the word hope, it's actually the same root word from which we get the word to curve, or to bend, all right? To curve or to bend. So therefore, at the root of the word hope, we have that this is connotation of a change in direction, right? Going in a different way. I like that, right? And if we look at the Hebrew and the Greek equivalent to this word hope, it, it talks about a strong and a confident expectation. So when we put these two together, right? What do we have? We have, we have this strong, confident expectation that a desirable change will happen. Not maybe, it's going to happen, right? Who wants 2021 to go in a different way, to change directions? This is the hope I want to talk to you about today. A hope to help you change your perspectives, right? To bend us away, to curve us away from focusing on, on, on earthly issues and looking forward to an eternal reward, eternal heaven and earth with our Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's what we need to be looking forward to. So where does this unbreakable hope come from? Well, if we look in Romans, we see that God is the source of our hope. In Romans 15, 13, Paul's writing here and he says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we look at the Passion Translation, it refers to God as the inspiration and the fountain of hope. Ooh, I really like that. So think about this. We got this, this God of hope. So our hope comes from God. He is the source of hope. And coming back to that word fountain in the Passion Translation, to me that implies something that's a, a continual source, right? Like a fountain is something that can continually give you something. So we have this, not only is God a source of our hope, He's nonstop. We're always going to have hope coming from God. Wow. I like that. All right. So let's think about this. I mean, if we're serving this God of hope, this, this source of hope, this inspiration and fountain of hope, then what exactly is the hope that he provides? Well, look with me, if you would, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Okay? 1 Peter 1, verse 3. We have Peter here, and this is, I love this book of the Bible. This is actually, it's a letter of hope. Peter is writing in this first book of Peter to Christians that are suffering. This is so applicable to, to life today, right? And so Peter writing to these Christians that are suffering, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. A living hope. Oh, man. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay. And we look at the, the, the Passion Translation. It talks about this hope as a, a living, energetic hope. I really like that word energetic. That catches my attention. Something that's energetic, that implies some type of action, right? Oh. And the Amplified Version says that this hope is an ever-living hope. Always living, right? Ever-living hope with, and a confident assurance. 
Now, now looking at this hope, this, this living hope, I really latch on to that, that word living. That really catches my attention, especially as a scientist. That's what really catches my attention is the word living. I, I'm fascinated. I really am I'm fascinated by how things work in the body, how our living body works. That's part of the, the, you know, what drove me to pursue a PhD in biomedical sciences. I just wanted to learn more. And so to me, when I see something, I think about something that's living, that implies lots of things. Something that's living, it's, well, it's alive, right? If it's living, it's active. Ooh, it can grow, right? Most likely, it's going to need some type of nourishment and care, okay? If it's alive, it's of living hope. It's, it's dynamic. It's fluid. It's ever-changing. It's, it's never static or stagnant, right? Living implies action. It implies energy expenditure, all these things, I don't know, that, that fires me up. This doesn't sound like some boring, wishful thinking hope to me. This sounds like a hope that's going to give us action. Now, if we look at, at the living body, you know, we're all made up of living cells, and I'll try not to go into too much of the science part, but it, just, it does, it fascinates me. But you can break down any part of your body, your organ, your organ systems, any tissue, and if you look at the microscopic level, it's really microscopic cells, right, that are at really the functional living units of your body. And it's those cells that work together to perform functions for whatever organ or organ system is working, right? So throughout my training in, in my graduate school and, and trying to learn more about how living cells work, you know, we take lots of classes, take lots of graduate level classes and lots of courses, and a lot of times you have textbooks, right, to help you, right? So I had lots of classes trying to learn about the living cells and what happens inside a cell. So for example, this is one of my textbooks from, I think it's like my molecular and cell biology class or something, but the, the the title of this book is Molecular Biology of the Cell, all right? And it, I know I'm a nerd. I love this book. It's so cool. It has so much cool stuff in it. All the things that are in here, this huge, humongous, thick book, it's all just talking about things that take place inside one single cell that we can't even see with the naked eye that God created, but yet it fills out this humongous book. So that's a so, completely separate sermon. But what I want to get at is that we've got textbooks, right, that can help me to learn more about living cells, Right? Well, do we have a textbook that can help us learn about living hope? Huh? Yeah, we do. Aha, uh -huh, we do, don't we, Paula? That's right. Our answer to this is in Romans again. So if we look at Romans 15:4, Paul tells us that for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have what? We might have hope. Oh, I love that. The passage, trans the passage translation uh, refers to the, that these scriptures impart to us encouragement and inspiration so that we can do what? We can live in hope and endure some things. Endure what? A few things. No. Endure all things. Right? So we can live in hope and endure all things. Man, I'm getting fired up, y'all. Now, if we look at the Amplified Version, sorry, I'm, I'm, I love going through different versions of Scripture. I, I, I just get carried away with that, so I apologize for that. But it, I liked how the Amplified Version also talked about that, you know, through these Scriptures, that through the endurance and the encouragement of these Scriptures, we might have hope and also overflow with confidence in His promises. Wow. So we do have a textbook, right? We have a textbook for this living hope. Man, we are so blessed today. We have the Bible. We have all these scriptures that Paul was talking about, New and Old Testament. We have access. To, we can find the phone on our, you know, a phone, a computer, anything. We have so blessed. We don't get persecuted for looking at this, do we? We have a textbook for life. Now, some of you out there may be a little skeptical. You're like, all right, whatever, Ryan. Let me get this right. So you're telling me this God of hope, this source of hope, he's going to help me live in hope. And he's going to give me hope to endure all things by learning and reading from his scriptures? Well, how do I know if these scriptures are true? Come on. Well, that's, that's a good question. You, you have to ask questions like that, right? Well, so now is maybe a time I, I should probably tell you something that, that God cannot do. That's right. I, um, yes, this all-powerful God, this, this source of hope, the source of salvation, mercy, and justice— the amazing creator of everything, there's something he cannot do. I'm just getting out of the way because there's a lightning bolt coming down. I, I think I can talk about this at church. Do you know what God can't do? He can't lie. 
God cannot lie. Look with me at Hebrews 6, 18, would you? Hebrews 6, 18. So it is impossible for God to lie. For we know that his promise and his vow will never change. Wow. We have this certain hope, like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. And we see in Titus 1, 2, Paul writing to his friend Titus in the island of Crete. says, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised from the beginning of time. Wow. I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of confidence, guys. I look at this and think, okay, well, if God can't lie, that means he cannot break his promises. If he cannot break his promises, you know what that means? That means our hope is certain. That means our hope is secure. It means it's immovable. It means it's an anchor of the soul. It gives stability to the Christian life. There should be no doubt whatsoever in our minds concerning the promises that Lord, the Lord has told us because he stands by his word. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changes. He's, he's not a person. We make mistakes. We change, right? God never changes. His promises always come true. He does not lie. So if he cannot lie, this means that all this scripture here is true. At least to me, I believe it. And I firmly believe that all this scripture is what? It's God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that I will be thoroughly equipped to do all the good work that God called me to do. And he's called you to do, right? So, unlike this uh, very heavy and expensive textbook that I had to purchase, which now is filled with errors now. There's lots of things we figured out as scientists that are not right in this thing, right? So, unlike this textbook for living cells, our textbook for life, it's much more lightweight and economical. And it's true. There's no errors in this. And we'll give you one for free. And... And I've read this thing several times. It is filled with thousands of promises. And if God can't lie, that means all these promises, all the ones that haven't come true, that means they're going to come true. So all these thousands of promises that haven't come true, they're going to come true one day. And I absolutely believe that. So come back with me, if you would, to First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, in this context of knowing that God cannot lie. So we know in verse 3 that we, we're getting this new living hope, right? Well, if we go into verse 4, there's more. Can you believe that? He gives us even more. So not only do we have a hope that we can live in, in verse 4 he says we have an inheritance that never perishes, can never spoil, never fade. Wow. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Let's look at this again. So we had, one, we're getting this awesome inheritance that's never going to spoil or fade. That, that, That just kind of blows my mind to think about something that we can't even fathom really. But where is this inheritance at? It's in heaven, right? We look in the scripture, it says it's in heaven. We will not get this inheritance on earth. So why do we look for it here? We're always looking for things on this earth, right? We've got to look beyond and above this earth and its earthly problems to a future world and a future heaven with no sin, no pain, no suffering, right? Where we have a future eternal life with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we need to be putting our focus. You know, C.S. Lewis has a really a great quote about hope, and I know we've probably seen it several times in this church, but I think it's worth showing again. Um, so C.S. Lewis says that hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those who were just, were just those who thought most of the next, right? Thinking about that next perfect eternal world. So we need to take our eyes off of things of this earth and focus on eternal things, right? You know, even though we may be looking forward to this eternal perfect world, there are going to be troubles. We're going to go through hardships. I mean, Jesus told us we, we were guaranteed hardships. We know that we're, going to, that we're going to endure hard things. But Jesus said, take heart. I've overcome the world. We're going to make it through this. 
Now, personally, I think probably one of the, the hardest things that I've ever had to go through so far in this life um, was my mom coming down with ovarian cancer and, and succumbing to that disease. You know, I still remember getting that phone call from my mom. Um, and she'd gotten a report from her doctors, and they told her that her ovaries were about the size of a softball when they should be about the size of an almond. You know, given, so my training's in reproductive biology, and so unfortunately for me, I know quite a bit about ovarian cancer. And when my mom called me that day, she hadn't been diagnosed yet, but when she was telling me all of her symptoms and everything, you know, it hit me then. It hit me in, in my heart of hearts. I knew, I knew then that she had ovarian cancer. I didn't want to say it out loud. I didn't want to tell anyone, but I just knew that that probably was what it was. And I knew how deadly that disease was and how that cancer is so devastating. And I think anyone that has cancer and had a loved one that has cancer can, can relate to this, right? And so watching my mom go through this suffering from the disease and then the treatments, as you guys know, if you've had a loved one that suffers from cancer, a lot of times the chemo and the radiation treatment, all these things, they're just as bad as the disease, aren't they? They're so hard on the person and the family. You know, and it's tough too because my mom, this same mom that ran and tried to catch up with this Jimmy, right, when she's like a week postpartum, just strong, confident Christian woman who was so healthy, 60 years old, never smoked, never drank, great health. How did she come down with ovarian cancer, right? I had all these questions for God. I didn't understand why. I didn't know what God was doing. And I struggled with that, and I, but I prayed continuously. I, I, hel- I hoped, I hoped, I hoped for a miraculous cure, and I continued to pray every day that my mom would get better. Long story short, she didn't. She passed. She died. I was devastated. I was torn. I was in pain, right? I felt hopeless. I really was in pain. I, I tried to, and I tried to fix things my own way, right? We're trying to, we try to be, try to be men. We try to, you know, suck it up and get going. You know, I, I can do this on my own. I didn't work so well. You know, trying to dull the pain with alcohol or anything didn't help. It only made things worse. Only when I started coming back to Scripture and seeking God's guidance did things start to change. Amen. It was when I started coming back to Scripture. It was when I started coming back to hope. Hope and Scripture helped me to change my perspective. It helped me to quit focusing on these earthly issues and the problems that are here, and it helped me to lift my eyes up. And I started focusing on eternal things and eternal glories that are to come. And that's what's really started changing my perspective. And I just want to share a few verses with you that is, I love, that have really helped me. And these are just some of the verses that are guarantees of our future eternal glories that if you're a Christian, you're guaranteed to have. So if we look in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, it says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, right? Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Oh, I love that. I, I get goosebumps from that. I'm just thinking that something we can't see is eternal, you know, but that's what I'm hoping for. Now, I got to admit, you know, when my mom was dying, I'm seeing her suffer and going through cancer and, and all this pain. And then when she died, did that seem light and momentary trouble to me? <laughs> no, right? They don't seem like light and momentary troubles at the time. But I can tell you now, looking back, changing my perspective, if looking at comparing the amount of time that my mom spent on this earth compared to eternity, with my Lord and Savior, there's no comparison, right? And knowing that, yeah, maybe I had this brief amount of time on this earth with my mom, and even though it's so hard for me to know that my grand, my, her granddaughter, my daughter, won't get to grow up with my mom, I know that one day in eternity, we'll get to be with my mom and my daughter's Mimi forever. That started changing my perspective, and I started thinking, okay, I can get through this, right? And another one that really helped me is Romans 8:18. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So you see in both these verses, you know, we're looking for things that are unseen, right? These eternal things, but also we're having to wait for them. And that can be hard. It's not easy. And I'm not going to say it was easy going through these hard and difficult times. But what I can tell you is that I now know, like looking back and going through all these difficult times, I definitely have more hope. I have more perseverance. I have more character. 
And you know why? It's in the Bible, right? If we go to Romans 5, 2 through 4, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, this is one of those verses that can be hard to swallow, right? You're like, so you're telling me I got to rejoice when I suffer? <laughs> That's crazy. It's not easy, right? But I can tell you, I promise you that I, in my own life, I know I've got more perseverance, I've developed more character, and I have more hope because I went through all those hard things with my mom passing. Hope helped curve and bend me away from my earthly thinking and dwelling on these worldly problems. And hope helped me to start focusing on things that were above, eternal things, unseen things, things that, I'll, that will be these future glories. Do you want a hope like that? Do you have a hope like that? Where are you placing your hope today? Well, if you've kind of tuned out for most of this message and you're just now coming back in, don't worry. The take-home answer is this. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the hope. Jesus is this unbreakable hope that I'm talking about. Come back to 1 Peter 1.3, right? He says right there that we get this living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Pretty simple. The key is Jesus. That's the only way that we can receive this living hope. That's the only way that we can get into these future eternal glories, all right? Now, this raises a really important question. Have you ever given your life to Jesus? Do you ever remember a time where you truly asked him to enter into your life and to take over? Or maybe, you, maybe you've walked away and you feel like you need to redirect your life to Christ. And if, if you're new to this, it doesn't matter what you've done. Hey, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This whole room's full of sinners and hypocrites, right? It doesn't matter what you've done. You may think, oh, they don't know what I've done. We don't care. God already knows everything you've done. You're not hiding from Him. All you've got to do is come to Him, all right? So if you, if you would like to, to ask this Jesus to enter into your life, I would just ask that everyone, if, if you would, just, just close your eyes and bow your heads. And if, if you want to say this prayer, you can just repeat after me. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just repeat it in your heart. God hears you. All right? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, and thank you for your son, Jesus. God, I just come to you knowing and telling you that I am a sinner. I have fallen short. I have tried to live my own way, and I have rebelled. I have been disobedient, and I've tried to do things my own way. God, I believe that you are the only God. I believe that you sent your one and only Son to this earth. I believe that he lived a sinless life on this earth, and I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he paid the ransom for my sins, and I believe that he was raised to life on the third day. God, Please enter into my life. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me. I want you to direct my life. Help me to be the man or woman that you want me to be, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Because we know, right, it says in Romans that if, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you prayed this prayer today, I want to be the first to welcome you into this body of believers of Jesus Christ. And I want to welcome you into this living hope that's going to help you for the rest of your life. And if you made this decision today, we want to hear from you. We really do. Uh, we would love to, you can come up and talk to me. You can talk to any of the elders. You can contact us online. I know we'll have a, you can get, contact us at getreallife.org slash follow Jesus. We'd just love to hear from you and get you started on any of your next steps as you grow in this, in this Christian life. Now, as we close, I, I just want people to remember that, you know, we may be at the end of the rope, but we're never at the, at the end of hope. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, eventually we will all live with Christ forever in a world with no sin, right? No pain, no tears, no suffering, no pandemics, no mask, no Zoom meetings, no hand sanitizer. Man, amen. I can't wait for that day. So by reflecting on this perfect world to come, we can have hope 
that empowers us to live fully for Christ today. So before we go, again, the professor and me kind of looks at life, and this Bible is really is our textbook for life. So if you need a textbook for this, this course in life called Life 101, we'd love to get you one. We have Bibles out here at the Welcome Center. We'd love to get you one and get you started in, in your daily reading of Scripture. And also, I'd like to challenge everyone, really, please go try to read the book of 1 Peter uh, today or sometime this week, because it truly is a letter of hope. And I hope it's, it's very applicable to our lives today. And I hope this will just, I hope, <laughs> pun intended, I hope that this really get, will get you on to a daily reading of Scripture and it's help you to, to grow in Christ and to grow in hope. May God be with you all as you go today. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Thanks man. Wow. Thank you, Ryan. You were blessed by that. Amen? I, I knew what was coming, so I knew that you would be blessed by that. You can't tell it was his first time. You know, intelligent people intimidate me. Did he really say he enjoyed that textbook? Did it, someone else, like there's cool stuff in there? Yeah, all right. I read it. It's not that fun. I don't think many, many of you would enjoy it. Now, thank you, Ryan, for that beautiful message. And just a reminder, if you prayed that prayer with him, let us know by going to getreallife.org slash follow Jesus. So the, allow us to help you with next steps. We want to help you with this journey. What you're really doing is beginning a relationship, a beautiful relationship, the most intimate, special, powerful, significant relationship that you can ever have in life and in eternity, quite frankly. And so let us help you by going to that and letting us know the decision that you made today. To our guests once more, if you would allow us to thank you more personally by filling out one of our Connect cards, either online or at the Welcome Center. Also, to all of you, if you have a need that you would like to share with us so that we can be praying for you, you can do that at getreallife.org slash prayer and just share with us what's happening. There are lots of us that receive every one of these needs as they come, and we pray for them. We're faithful to pray, we're diligent to pray, and we're believing God on your behalf. And so share those things with us. Your staff, your elders, your Titus women and others are praying for you, and so share those needs with us. And so right now, I want to pray for us as we finish today and go our way and be his hands and feet. And so I would invite you, as I often do, if you're able, would you stand with me as we pray? Father, we thank you. What a beautiful message to kick off the year, Lord, to be reminded of that blessed hope that we have in you. Lord, the Hebrew writer spoke of hope as being the anchor of our soul. And it reminds me of the function of an anchor on a ship. And it doesn't do anything to the weather or the storms or the waves or the tossing seas. The anchor is meant to hold the vessel steady while that storm rages and ultimately passes. And God, coming off of 2020, we can all relate to stormy seas in life. And, but what a beautiful thing to be reminded of today that we have your blessed hope, your hope that is an anchor in our lives and in our souls. And come what may. Whatever life might throw at us, whatever we might face in this world, Lord, if we have our faith and our confidence in your hope and the hope that you give us in your son, Jesus Christ, ha, we will be held steady no matter the storm that rages around us. And God, help us to not hold selfishly to this hope. I pray for all of us as we leave this room today that we would carry this hope with us and that we could become a beacon of hope in the lives of others as we share our story and as we share our faith with others and as we live evangelistically, a big word, just meaning that we share you with all of, all of those that we have an opportunity to do so. We know that if we are sincere about that, that you will present those opportunities. And God, help us as we begin this new year to be mindful of them and to be obedient and to take advantage of those moments because often those moments are an open doorway to their soul, that they're ready to hear your wonderful message of hope for their lives and for their eternity. Again, we thank you. God, we ask that you would go with us now. We love you. We trust you. We love serving you. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. God bless you all. Thank you again for being here and worshiping with us. Have a wonderful week. God bless.